thank you, Ali. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, so basically, at Raj Capital, we were uh, eyeing the hospitality and tourism sector for quite so long. Uh, the hospitality sector and the tourism in general have witnessed a major transformation uh, over the past few years. And we think that from an investment opportunity, there is a massive uh, room for us to participate as a capital market and allow uh, for such an investment product to be offered uh, through us. Uh, the hospitality sector have uh, witnessed these reforms from one side and witnessed a lot of change in the consumer demands uh, and in the variety of locations and destinations uh, that would be uh, considered as uh, a good market, a new market uh, to be approached. Uh, from there, uh, we have actually been approached uh, along with uh, several other uh, capital firms by TDF uh, in light of the partnership or the MOU that has been signed uh, between TDF and NSMOR for the rollout of such an expansion program uh, to develop uh, 10 to 12 hotels across Saudi. And that got our excitement uh, and energy quite high, knowing that you will have that immediate exposure to all these primary and secondary cities uh, from an exposure perspective into a single vehicle and a single investment fund. Right, and you know, real estate is a risky asset class. Within that, hotels tend to be fairly risky. Secondary cities have a degree of risk to them. And you know, the common uh, opinion often is that even these lifestyle brands, which perhaps have less of a footprint, have a degree of risk to them as well. So you know, why did you choose to go towards the lifestyle direction instead of the more traditional core brands? And then I'll, I'll touch on you afterwards, perhaps. Sure. Uh, so basically, uh, looking at the demand and the underlying demand that we actually are experiencing today uh, in the Saudi market, uh, it's not just a lodging space that uh, the experience and the entire journey uh, really what really makes a difference uh, in terms of what's the right offering that could be provided. Uh, so in light of that and looking at how lifestyle hotels has actually been growing in the past uh, globally, uh, we think that this is the right product for us to be part of in the launch and ensuring that it gives the right outreach. And I know probably you're, you're itching to get in on this. I mean, you know, as a hotel operator, you're a key component to this all. Uh, you know, what does Ennismore bring to the table and why do you think that you were, the, you were the partner that was selected? Sure, thank you, Ali. Just to add uh, a bit on, on what was just said, if you look at a traditional hotel and you focus on a pure lodging facility, then you're tapping into one customer, which is a traveler, a visitor that's coming abroad or visiting. The advantage of what we do, and I think we do quite well, is that our hotels are predominantly designed and built for the community for the place where they are in. So you're one tapping into the domestic direct environment, direct environment around you, and then you're tapping into a traveler, which, get, which makes it much more interesting and significantly a better investment, because you have quality food and beverage, you have quality entertainment, you have amazing co-working spaces, and then you have amazing rooms. And I think from a pure investment perspective, you really taking a lower risk because you have two customers that you're focusing on. Okay, I know that's understood. And then also from an investment perspective, I mean, when developers participate in this fund, are these, are these terms that they would have with you, are they pre-negotiated or are they done on a case-by-case -case basis yeah. so, or is that yet to be decided? So we've, we've already pre-negotiated all of the terms uh, with uh, the fund manager and the main sponsor. I think they've done a great job uh, negotiating fair terms uh, and I think that is what all owners should try to do, is negotiate fair terms and not try to squeeze operators. Because once you squeeze operators too much and they cannot make enough fees, you won't be uh, their focus anymore. Because all operators have a list of highly performing hotels in terms of fees, and those are the ones they will focus on. So yes, they've done a great job in structuring a deal where if we do great, they would do great, and if they do great, we'll be doing great as as well. Understood. Understood. And uh, well done for you. I mean, TDF's role to me was not immediately obvious. But before we get into that, I mean, perhaps you can touch a little bit more about on, on TDF. You know, how, how do you differ from a funding institution? Are you similar or, or, what, or what the differences are? So uh, thank you, Ari. It's a great pleasure to be with uh, uh, 
uh, Asim uh, from an investment banking, one of uh, the gurus, uh, with Luis, one of the gurus in hospitality. So I'm very happy to be in this panel and with you as well, Ali. So um, TDF, since inception as part of uh, NTS, as part of the ecosystem of tourism, uh, it was established in 2020. The focus was to complement commercial banks and what they're doing. They focus more on main cities. We focus more on tier two cities. This is where we complement each other and we uh, uh, lower the risk of banks in entering into tier two cities. So a big difference between us and commercial banks, we're uh, economic impact driven. So us as an ecosystem, we focus more on GDP contribution, on number of visits. We focus more on uh, jobs. Uh, adding jobs to the industry, whether it is direct or indirect. Um, we take hand in hand investors through an investor journey from conception, from the idea, from the beginning. Uh, we give them, uh, provide information about destinations. We have uh, did the gap analysis on, on all the destinations understanding more about the value proposition, about the economic indicators, about the offering of each destination before we started uh, beginning uh, uh, the strategy of the fund and where to focus on the fund. So um, in brief, in TDF, we have uh, financial support and we have non-financial support. And, and in my mind and, and through the journey with different investors, we found out that uh, non-financial support might be as much important as the financial solutions that we have. So we do support in information, we do support in real estate and identifying lands and master plan of uh, our projects, projects components, uh, choosing the right operators, etc. This is all uh, as uh, done by uh, TDF as support to our investors. Uh, from a financial su uh, support, uh, we have three terms of support, so we do equity, we do debt, we do guarantees, we do customized solutions based on gaps of the projects. Uh, so our participation is really based on the gap of the project. This is, if it is towards the equity, there is, this is where we will focus. If it is towards the debt, we will focus more on debt. If it is in need of guarantees, we will focus more on the guarantees. As well, we have 17 products between short-term, mid-term, long-term products for our investors to support them financially. Uh, we also have a very important factor, which is the TDF Hub, uh, TDF Grow. We graduated entrepreneurs, 1,500 last year, and uh, gradually we will uh, train more to be ready to be financed from TDF. To support our large projects, we will need uh, a lot of support from uh, the small and micro to uh, attract the right uh, services and offering in our uh, big projects. So let's say I'm a developer and I want your support. What would you look at for me as a developer to fund my project? Uh, absolutely. We will look into uh, how can... Uh, one of the most important things maybe I missed out is profitability for our uh, investors and developers and operators as well. We're not IRR dri driven. Uh, we're sustainable... Uh, financial sustainability driven, but at the same time, we focus on enhancing and increasing the profitability, and we uh, support developers in, in locations, in lands, in the project components on the value proposition of each destination that we have here in Saudi Arabia. Understood, and then, and then you went sort of from, you know, the core of funding private single projects, and now you're sort of involved uh, with this fund. So, so how did that evolution happen? As I said, in our bylaws, we have the opportunity to participate in equity, and uh, it is in the form of uh, funds. So we cannot establish companies to compete with private sector. The idea is to create funds to attract the global names such as uh, Anismore and to work with the best investment banks in Saudi Arabia, such as Raji. Understood. And, and awesome for you, I mean, it seems that the development of funds is accelerating at a rate I've never seen before. Uh, everybody seems to be launching uh, sort of a new fund. I mean, what do you think has really driven this growth of funds? So basically, if you look at the uh, compounded annual growth rates uh, in real estate funds from 2016 till 2022, you're talking about an annual growth of 35.6%. Uh, 
so that is uh, a great growth within the industry. Uh, that growth is basically uh, driven by uh, a clear strategy and vision on the long term when it comes to uh, markets and sectors in particular. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the increased sophistication uh, of investors where they're looking for investment vehicles with high level of governance that would accommodate their partnerships and investment. Right, so if I'm an unsophisticated investor, which I probably am in your eyes, how would I be able to tell between a, you know, a strong fund and one that's slightly weaker? So uh, basically, in terms of assessment, uh, investors should, uh, in all cases, uh, ensure that they're doing a full and thorough due diligence on each and every single investment opportunity that they actually see, and ensure that it fits within their investment profiles, investment uh, risk return uh, profile, and in addition to their own asset allocation. Uh, but again, uh, if you look at it today, uh, the information that is available uh, on the track record, on the performance, parties involved within that uh, fund. So talking about the lifestyle fund, where you have NS Moore as the operator and you have TDF as the sponsor, Rajhi Capital as the fund manager, then that gives you a, a, a really a strong perspective of how the fund would look out. You have the 18. <laughs> and, uh, and with this specific fund, sort of what stage are you, are you at for, for, for the three of you? Are you almost ready to...? So the fund is actually established. Uh, we have TDF as an anchor investor. We already have uh, signed with uh, Ennismore as the operator of the fund. Uh, we actually are uh, in negotiation stages in several exciting opportunities. Uh, we're in the final stage of uh, negotiating the sell and purchase uh, of these uh, assets. And we are actually reviewing uh, several more uh, for the fund. Uh, so we are at that stage, uh, and we expect to uh, exponentially uh, progress with the fund uh, quite soon, inshallah. Understood. And I'll go to you, Wadan, and then, and then Louis. Um, for you, Wadan, do you see that future partnerships similar to the ones that you have right now are are, are on the cards for TDF, or, or is this sort of a, a one-and-done sort of situation? Absolutely. To tell you the truth, I think we will do similar projects and similar, uh, but it will be different in nature. So the value proposition will be different. In lifestyle, we focus more on Ennis Moore as the leading uh, global brand in the world. Um, in other areas, in family-oriented, cultural, uh, different uh, funds that we will do, it will have a different value proposition and it will tag, target a different segment. So we will do other funds, but it will be something different than what we have today with Raj and, and Ismar. Understood. And you know, with a lifestyle fund, lifestyle concepts live and die with authentic, authenticity uh, and not being manufactured uh, in, in, in many ways. I mean, can you think of some examples where you, know, you as an operator are planning to bring in the local culture into some of these assets or perhaps where you've done it before in other markets? No, of course, I think the, the most interesting part of, of this collaboration and partnership is that we can have a much bigger involvement in the creation and the establishment of our brands in the market because uh, both the fund manager and the sponsor TDF are allowing us to be really active in all stages of the project, which allows us to create products that are authentic and that actually be true to the brand. So we're part of the selection of the land. We're part of the selection of the right consultants. So we are part of the entire process that is far beyond what a typical operator usually is involved. But the outcome of this is going to be in line with how we succeeded with our brands in other markets. So we will create brands that are authentic to where they stand in. We're gonna be able to partner with the right uh, consultants. We're going to be able to bring in the right local collaborations. We are going to be able to do this the right way. And I believe ultimately when we step, step back three, four years down the road, I think we will all be proud of really bringing those lifestyle brands that are extremely well established in their respective markets, but represented well in a Saudi environment. So I think this is really unique and, and I think ultimately will benefit everyone. I mean, so tr trying to get this value proposition across is not an easy thing, and I think you have to have a certain type of de developer that will allow you to do that, or a certain type of owner that you work with that will allow you to do that. Um, I know people typically say, you know, developers, uh, real estate developers will choose operators, but in some cases I feel like maybe, you know, you also have to make that choice as, as an operator. I, I think in, in, um, 
in the space we, 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 we play within, the partner and the owner is the most important aspect of making the project real. Because we're not a standardized, we don't offer standardized products. We do not offer uh, the best uh, distribution and loyalty in the market. What we do extremely well is that we design and we program unique hotels. And once we open, we bring those hotels to life through proper collaborations, proper partnership, and hands-on day-to-day management. So this partnership is actually essential for us to be able to do that. And, and today in Saudi, unfortunately, that the money and the decision-making process is still relatively with an older generation that are still very, um, I would say, protective of the brands they, are, they know. While the industry has changed, people are no longer really interested, more or less, in traditional offering. People want alternative different, unique brands. And I think this is the, the, the best vehicle. And I think what TDF are doing is, has a financial aspect to it, but I also think it has a big impact on tourism. If you are a young German, uh, and you know that 25 hours is opening in a second tier city in KSA, you'll automatically say, okay, that city is relatively cool. There must be something culturally relevant and I'll probably consider going there. So, and you, if you're living in that secondary city, you'll be happy to know that I'm gonna have a hotel that is cool to show someone when they come in. It's a hotel that is gonna have a nice public space where I can go work in, and I'll be proud to take my friends for a dinner on the rooftop. So it's really a smart proposition for an international traveler, and again, to the crowd that are living around those hotels. Uh, to tell you the truth, I just wanna add something, I think, we took our time in the negotiation with Ennis Moore and with the Rajhi Capital in this. Um, we're trying to look at the global trends and we wanted to see where is the focus of the industry moving forward and that we, there was a lot of focus on lifestyle. And this is where really it started. We started matching NTS, the National Tourism Strategy, with the Ennis Moore Strategy. Uh, involving Raja Capital from a financial uh, or an investment perspective and in structuring this uh, fund. Again, the fund will be uh, 1.5 billion riyals. Uh, we have already seeded TDF the first um, uh, batch. Uh, we will raise uh, from the market uh, as moving forward and we're looking into opportunities to deliver around 2,000 keys uh, in the next uh, upcoming years. Thank you. Okay. And yeah, looking at these, at these projects, and I know everyone is sort of saying it's not primarily financially driven, but that is an element to it. So, you know, awesome for you. Look, when you look at the financials of these secondary cities, how do they stack up when you're looking at more core projects in primary cities? Are they better or worse, or is there no such comparison that can be made? So it's, uh, uh, the way you look at it is uh, when you talk about uh, tier two cities, immediately you would uh, consider or what really comes to mind from a stereotyping perspective is low occupancy, low ADR, and then lower GOP. Uh, but the reality is the offering from one side is not there. Um, from the other side, you see a lot of initiatives and efforts are being exerted to uh, really establish these destinations and create uh, an entire ecosystem within these uh, destinations rather than just building a hotel. Yeah. Uh, so we, with all of these efforts, we expect that the tier two cities would actually uh, be a good competitor in terms of returns uh, to tier, tier one cities, uh, rather than um, uh, a lagger in terms of performance. Yeah, no, I understood. And for, yeah. uh, sorry? sorry to interrupt again, but for each destination, there is a value proposition, even in tier two cities. If you look into Al Baha, for example, uh, Her Excellency Gloria, the previous uh, session, was talking about wellness, for example. It's an excellent destination for wellness and hiking, adventure, a lot of other. Uh, if you go to Al Ula, it's mainly heritage. Mm -hmm. And each destination, you're going to find a value proposition different than. And this is what makes Saudi uh, very attractive for a lot of people. The different value proposition in different areas and different destinations that complements the tourist journey is something that is very highly appreciated. Understood. Okay, so I think we are on the last little bit. So I think 
maybe final thoughts, you know, what, maybe why don't you could start, what you see on the horizon in terms of, you know, hospitality funds and, and, and private sector development? Uh, yes, I think there will be, uh, we're working a lot with private sector and, and developing opportunities. Today, TDF, the whole mandate is really to enable private sector and to enable uh, developers, private investments into the industry. And uh, it is uh, the main thing that we do. So uh, we will remain focusing on this moving forward. And, uh, and how about yourself? How do you see that your role will evolve as this fund evolves? And then how do you see? Sort of, and it's more in the wider I, case I, market. I think the, the, the fund is, is becoming more interesting by the day for us because we are, we are able to take risks that usually uh, risks, and, and, but we're, we'll be able to explore opportunities that typically a conservative uh, investor wouldn't be able to do. And, and to tap on what you were saying, Wahdan, we're looking, for example, to do the first, for example, uh, all-inclusive lifestyle mid-market resort in the kingdom, which is someone no one is doing, and we know, we all know there's a massive opportunity for it, but no one is actually taking the bet in order to do it. We're looking at how can we look at a, a tented experience, but done in a quirky and an elevated manner. Those are all things that everyone around this room would say, yes, this would definitely work, but no one's actually investing in those. And I think this is what we will be doing, and this is what will uh, create value. So, th I mean, that is something you're open to, to developing one of a kind uh, hotels that aren't seen elsewhere in the world with brands that exist. Yeah, I, I think what makes Anismore very different is that we have the founders that created all of the brands, extremely innovative people with great vision that are still on board with them. If you bring them and you tell them, I want you to innovate and create something that is truly unique in Al-Ula, yeah. uh, very few players can actually do that. We're given the chance to do that. We have the, the, the resources to do it, and I, and I, and I think... Uh, this is going to give the kingdom a proposition that is unique regionally and globally. Understood. Okay. And uh, Asim, I guess the last word is with you. Uh, what are your thoughts on funds in, in the kingdom and, and what challenges do you think uh, will, will come up as this sort of as the space evolves? Uh, so basically, uh, I think the uh, economic environment that we're in uh, is one of the key challenges uh, with increased interest rate uh, being where they are today. Uh, and with the latest hike uh, last week, then we're looking at uh, a tougher market in terms of an investment environment from an investment perspective. Uh, people are resorting more towards cash and lower risk fixed income uh, assets uh, from an allocation perspective. Uh, but uh, still there is room when you have a good investment proposition uh, and a good prospective return that is being uh, generated or expected to be uh, generated from these funds. The demand is still there, uh, and the demand we expect it to only grow in the future. All right. Well, uh, thank you. I think we're sort of out, of out of time now, so I thank you all for attending this session. And um, yeah, I'm sure we'll all see you outside. Thank you very much. <laughs>